How is everybody today? Great. Well, you know, I, I have to admit something. I'm a little thrown off because I thought we were coming here to see the new George Clooney, Ryan Gosling movie. So I've got to switch gears here. No, I'm joking. I, I know why I'm here. I'm here because I love kids. Does anyone else here love kids? Yes. Yeah. My people. I believe in their unlimited potentials. Does anyone else share that belief with me here? Yes. Yeah, right? Good, because that's the starting place. Now, children are without a doubt our most valuable resource on this planet. Without a doubt. And there's this Chinese proverb that I really love. And it's, one generation plants the trees while another enjoys the shade. And I live by it, but I have to ask, we, are we, what kind of trees are we planting? And by we, I mean the adults, the decision makers, the legislators, the schools, the, the parents, the, the media. What kind of trees are we planting for our future generations? It kind of seems to me like we're planting a little bit more poison ivy than nice sturdy oaks. And, and, and these kids, our most valuable resource, our sustainable, renewable resource, they're, they're growing up itching and scratching and lost and confused and detached and really, really unhealthy. And it, we have to do something about it. We have to. Now, in last year's TED conference, one of my idols, Jamie Oliver, he spoke about the major epidemic going on with the childhood obesity crisis. And he went through all of the statistics. I'm not going to go into that. You can Google that. But the thing about the statistics is these aren't just lines on a graph or colors on a map or numbers with percentage signs after them. These are real people. These are real children growing up with real challenges in a huge poison ivy patch unless we do something about it. Now, I have to ask, why have obesity rates more than tripled in the last three decades? I mean, when I was a kid growing up, there was rarely an overweight kid. And now I work with about 20,000 different children a month throughout the country in our school fitness programs. And I can't tell you how many out of shape, overweight, obese, elementary school kids I see every day. I mean, it's actually becoming the norm. What happened? Now, of course, all the fingers point to video games, computers, TV, fast food, processed junk. But the thing I don't really understand is that we had that when I was a kid. I mean, we ate at fast food restaurants. We had candy and, and, and junk food and soda and, and chips. We had all that. I mean, we didn't have the laptops and the iPads and the computers. I mean, I'm a little older than I look, certainly older than I act. But, but we had TV. You know, of course, in the early days, you had to get up to change the channel, you know, all five of them. I guess you got a little exercise in there, and, you know, when you had to fiddle with the antenna, it's, you know, good workout for your arms. I mean, I don't know, but, but that was when I was really young. By the time I was in elementary school, we had the remote control, we had cable TV, we had lots of channels, we had MTV, you know, we had video, kill the radio, start, we had all that. We had video games. I mean, it wasn't the whole reality, 3D, virtual world that the kids are living with now on every device. But gaming was a big part of growing up. So what happened? You know, one thing that we did have that kids, for the most part today, they don't get to experience is that unplanned yet highly anticipated knock on the door where it's your friend asking you if you can come out and play. The whole concept of going out and playing, it doesn't seem to exist nowadays. Why? Why is it called a play date? And why is it, you know, scheduled weeks and months in advance? And why does play usually mean indoors with very little creativity and you, next to no physical activity? And if there is physical activity, all you hear is, you know, don't climb on that, watch out, that's dangerous. I mean, why? 
When I was a kid, we were expected to go outside and play. I mean, I got in trouble if I came home before dinner time. Now, perhaps, you know, my parents got sick of me and wanted to get me out of their hair, but I mean, all the neighborhood kids were outside playing, and none of us had GPS tracking devices on our bodies, uh, cell phones hadn't been invented yet. I don't even think call waiting hadn't been invented yet. You know, I, I recently asked my mom if she ever worried about us going outside, playing unsupervised all day, and she said, no, we were just being kids. So that, that pervasive fear that the world is not a safe place, it hadn't been bought into by society yet. And I mean, sure, there were kidnappers. There were always new kids' faces on milk cartons, and you know, the, there, there were drugs. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I mean, take a look at what everyone was wearing and tell me that they weren't on drugs, you know? I mean, the fashion, uh, and, and there was crime. I grew up in New Jersey. This is the pre snooky era. I mean, my friend's dad owned a garbage truck company. You know what I mean? Like, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, that's where I grew up. So we had all that, um, you know, and sometimes we got hurt playing outside unsupervised. I fell out of a tree once, but I was allowed to climb that tree. It was my favorite thing to do. So I, I really do think that not playing outside has a lot to do with the childhood obesity epidemic. And then I have a question. Maybe you can help me with it because I can't find an answer. Okay, if we have this huge crisis, I mean the biggest healthcare crisis this nation has ever seen because of obesity, why are quality physical education programs in schools virtually extinct? I mean, there are so many, most of the schools have cut PE entirely out of their day. And this is despite the overwhelming evidence that shows conclusively that a child who is physically fit and has adequate nutrition, they do better academically. It doesn't make any sense. And then when I do see a PE program, this is usually what I see, a bunch of kids hating life, being forced to just run laps. You know, they're just like slumped over and walking and, 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 and there's an adult standing there with a whistle yelling at them to run. I mean, what is that? That is not PE. I, I don't know. And then the other question I have is why is kinesthetic learning non-existent in the classroom? especially with ADD and ADHD diagnoses on the rise. I mean, I really wonder if we'd have such behavioral and focusing issues if kids were allowed to move while they're learning. I mean, we all have bodies. We're born to move, weren't we? So why aren't we? Why are we just teaching from the neck up? I don't know. So how do we do it? How do we get kids to be physically active, to want to be, to enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's my personal goal to take the word fitness from being a bad F word to being a good F word, fun. You know, I want these muscles to be the ones that are sore at the end of a workout. So, so, so how do we do it? By engaging them where they're at. Now let's first take a look at where they are at as a generation, okay? It's, it's, it's a different world, all right? These kids are hardwired differently, okay? For those of us who are stuck in an analog operating system, it's time to reboot because these kids are beyond broadband. I mean, everything's instantaneous and at their fingertips. I was recently at my friend's house and she has a little, cute little three-year-old boy and we're hanging out and watching TV and this boy comes up and to the TV and goes like this trying to swipe it and enlarge it. He says, Mommy, it's broken. And I realized, oh my God, the world is different. I mean, these kids are plugged in, but they're disconnected. So how do we compete with that? How do we compete with the smartphones and the apps and the videos and YouTube and TV and elevators and automatic doors and immediate gratification? How do we do that? By engaging them where they are at, by using relevant, cool, pop culture, fun, funny, good-humoredly irreverent, social. I mean, it's got to be social. The kids, it's got to feel like a party, you know? 
It's got to look like a music video, feel like a concert, sound like the radio, and the kids need to feel like they are the rock stars. That's the way we've got to do it. You know, so when I first started teaching dance classes, I will admit that my classes more closely resembled Lord of the Flies than, you know, a typical dance class. But through the years and the millions and millions of children I've had the privilege to work with, I've developed a strategy. And this strategy I call, Honey, I Kung fu the Kids. Now don't worry, I'm not going to karate chop them. You don't have to call Child Protective Services on me. Um, but it's, it's using the principles of Kung Fu to work with kids and engage them. Does, do you guys know about Kung Fu at all? Okay, so like if you were coming at me, the last thing I would do is stand here and oppose you and enter into a clash of wills with you. I wouldn't win, there's no way. You have momentum, you have force, you have velocity. With the principle of Kung Fu, what I would do is I would use your momentum, I would harness your energy, I would work with it instead of against it and guide it and direct it and put you exactly where I want you. Weirdly enough, with your help. So it's from this place that I have the most success and the most participation with kids because I'm not in a power struggle with them. I'm translating my goals to their vibe so they join my side where we're a part of, where it feels like a party and everyone's invited. We're a tribe, you know, we're a kid tribe. And then once I have them, then we have all the added benefits of self-esteem, of burning calories, of sweating, of drinking water, of team building, of even learning core academics. But it's the reeling them in that counts. Because, you see, I, I want to reach the kids that don't go out for sports. I want to reach the boy who gets picked last on a team if he gets picked at all. I want to reach the girl who, she's, she's so self-conscious, she doesn't engage in anything. I want to reach the new kid who doesn't know anybody. I want to reach the obese child whose motto is, I can't do that. I want to reach the, the, the outcast who's getting bullied. I want to reach the group of bad kids who are really just misguided leaders. Because if we can reach them and make a transformation with these kinds of individuals, man, then we're really doing something. Then we're really creating an environment where change is happening, where these kids are connecting with themselves and their bodies and how their bodies like to move. I mean, you have that relationship for the rest of your life. You better make friends with yourself, right? And then we, the adults, we have to remember our responsibility. We're their role models. You know, I don't even really like that term because it implies that we're playing a role that isn't authentic or genuine. You know, and these kids, believe me, they have amazing BS detectors. So, so what I would rather do, instead of us being role models, what if we were real models and we showed through example? And we never forgot, we always realized the responsibility we have because these kids, every interaction we have with the youth can affect them positively or negatively. I'd like to close with a story that's near and dear to my heart. Um, recently, not too long ago, I was on a school assembly tour across the nation, working with school districts in very, very low-income areas. And you know, as you can imagine, our school assemblies are, <laughs> I mean, they're off the wall. There are these high-octane interactive events. The music's going, you know, it feels like a party. There's freestyle dancing, hip-hop, hula hooping, you know, everybody's just going crazy in a good way. And um, so I'm, I'm in the Ozarks. I don't know if anyone has ever been to the Ozarks, but when you're in the Ozarks, you can't help but feel like you are in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I guess because you are. And um, in this particular town I was in, there were many homes that didn't have any running water or electricity. I mean, this was a, this was a, a uniquely challenging place to grow up in. So anyway, 
we're at the event, you know, I'm on the mic, and there's hundreds and hundreds of kids, the music is going, and there's this boy, a, a rather big boy, right in the front, and he has a lot of energy, I mean, like, a lot of energy. And any time I'd ask a question, he would just blurt out the answer, you know? And, and so instead of trying to tame him and stop him, I kung fu'd him, and I started calling him Einstein. So I'm like, Einstein, how much water do we need to drink? You know, whatever the question was. So Einstein now became a part of. And then the event really starts going, and this Einstein, I mean, he was in his element. I mean, he, he was doing tricks with a hula hoop I'd never seen before. He was, I mean, sweat pouring down his face. He was just going for it. I, I brought him up on the stage and he was doing all his break dance moves and the whole, the whole school is going, Einstein, Einstein, Einstein. So the event is wrapping up and, um, and the school principal came up to me and she had tears in her eyes, and she gave me a huge hug. And she asked me if anyone had tipped, her, tipped me off about this Einstein. And I said, no, why? And she said, because Einstein is failing every class. His behavior is so disruptive that he has to be physically removed from every school assembly within the first 10 minutes. I mean, he's just out of control. The teachers don't know what to do with him. He's in danger of getting kicked out of school, and his parents are addicted to drugs, so there's no support at home. You know, and by then, I have tears in my eyes, and she just said, you know, it's from today, I have a new hope for this boy. I've never seen him so engaged and so eager. I've never seen him so appreciated by his peers. And I realize that he's got to move. He's got to learn through moving. And I, she had new hope for this boy, you know? And I left there crying and my heart beaming, realizing that the ripple effect of what we do, it's infinite and that a little kung fu goes a long way. So let's please learn what this Einstein of the Ozarks has to teach us. And let's plant good trees and keep planting because our kids, our future, they need it. Thank you so much. Have a great day.